This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. Um, Steph and I have been on a diet recently. Although I would argue that's not a particularly good way of saying it. You see, we've always been on a diet. Diet, I looked this up, diet is defined as the kind of food that a person habitually eats. So it's fair to say we have always been on a diet. However, we realized recently that the diet we have is not achieving in us what we want. Habitually eating foods that are not good for us is causing us to be on a trajectory towards people we don't want to be. That is a posh way of saying we were putting on weight. In order to counteract that, we decided to change our diet so that the food we were putting in does for our bodies what we want it to. Now, this truth extends beyond our food. If we were to take stock of the sum total of all food, drink, entertainment, stimuli, everything that comes in, we could describe that possibly as our full diet. It's what we are feeding ourselves on. And whatever these things are, they're going to be shaping us towards something. If we extend that metaphor a bit, it could be that we become more or less healthy based on where we get our nourishment and what that nourishment is. For Steph and myself, we looked at the physical consequences of the food we were eating and said, if we want this to change, we're going to have to change what we're eating. Now, some of us here might be looking at the lives we live and wonder, why does this not look like the life that God seems to have been talking about as we've gone through John over the last two months? I would like to offer that maybe... It might be the diet you're consuming. Jesus had a lot to say about this, which we're going to unpack a bit this morning. So today, like like Ian just said, we are going to be beginning our second teach through the Gospel of John. We've covered this book once, looking at the seven main sections or themes of the book. We've done that recently. Now we're going to go through the whole book again, this time looking at the seven times Jesus described himself beginning with the expression, I am. So, quick question. Do you remember what John's gospel is all about? Is there anyone who thinks they can tell me why John wrote his gospel? Either you're shy or I'm going to have to invoke the words of my old head of department. Oh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God by believing in his name. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Like After eight weeks, I'm going to say this, after eight weeks of teaching John, I'm going to use a line that my old head of department used to use with her sixth form classes when she'd been teaching the same thing for weeks and they still hadn't quite got it. She's got like, she goes, how do you not know this by now? She's just so frustrated. But she was from Lancaster. So be like, how do you not know this by now? Commit that line to your memory. It is fundamental for understanding everything we're looking at. In John 20, 21, he says, I have written these words that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you may have life in his name. All the way through, John is trying to convince you that Jesus is the promised Messiah and that what Jesus has to offer, if you trust in it, will bring you into the life that God has got for you. So everything has to be viewed through that lens when we approach this book. As we read through the seven I am statements, we must be asking questions like, okay, so is Jesus the Messiah? Or we might say, I wonder what what, what does life in his name look like? Or how do I get it? Because that's the point of this gospel, to get us to engage with questions like that. Now, to understand the significance of these I am statements, We need to just go back a bit in the Bible to Exodus chapter 3, 
when God introduces himself to Moses. Now, it's a famous story. Most, most people in, this, in the UK will grow up sort of knowing this story in one way or another, even if they're not church, because it's the story of the burning bush. And it says this in verse 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. See, I am became the sacred name of God to the Jewish people. It was a name that in the day of Jesus, you would not speak it out loud because it would be blasphemy. When written down, it is just written as a line because to write the name is to do something wrong with it. It is too sacred even to be written down. No first century rabbi would be flippant with the words, I am. They would not be accidentally said. So when Jesus says it seven times in the Gospel of John, we know he's trying to make a point. He's trying to make a point. So with all that in mind, let's just read the passage that we're going to be looking at today. For context of this passage, it's found in John 6. Just before this passage, Jesus has fed the 5,000. It is John records it is at the time of Passover. Passover is happening. Uh, it's just in the run-up to, to the Passover festival. And he's just fed 5,000 people on the shore of Galilee. He has then taken a shortcut across the lake. That's the walking Jesus walks on water story. And the people, some of that crowd who had eaten with the 5,000, have circled around the lake to find Jesus and his disciples on the other side. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to, what, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, Give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This, um, the message here, I don't think is overly cryptic. The metaphor Jesus is using here is not overly cryptic. Jesus is invoking an understanding that these people would have quite happily had. It was the time of Passover, right? So think about our sort of religious festivals. Don't necessarily think about just the festival. Think about what goes on around it, you know? We don't just have Christmas Day in this country. But in the run-up to Christmas, we tell the story of the Nativity disproportionately to the rest of the year. I'm sure you'd agree. The story of Jesus' birth is told more in December than it is, for instance, in June, right? Easter is similar. When we get to Easter, we tell the story of the resurrection, more so than possibly other times of the year. 
And that's true of religious festivals, that when they come about, the stories of that festival are being told. So the fact that this is in the run-up to Passover is really important. And the fact that these people have just eaten of God and taken time to get there. You think about what are they doing as they're walking around the lake? Well, it's Passover. They're telling the story of Moses in the burning bush. They're telling the story of Pharaoh and the plagues. They're telling the story of the flight from Egypt. They're telling the story of the manna in the wilderness. Because those stories are intrinsically linked to the time of Passover. They are reminiscing. And possibly even more so, since suddenly this amazingly godly prophet man, who they're not quite sure who he is, has just somehow miraculously fed them with only a few loaves and fish. You know, when we're hungry, we eat. It's quite natural. These people were hungry. Even though they, if we think, oh, they've just been fed, they're finding 5,000, they had as much as they eat. That was yesterday. And the thing about hungry is, it comes around fairly predictably on a cycle. If I went out for an all-you-could-eat today, and I had significantly more food than I should possibly even ever need, it does not mean I'm skipping lunch on Tuesday. That's not how we work, is it? So Jesus calls them on this. When they come to him, he calls them and he says, you haven't walked all the way around the lake because you saw a miracle. You've walked all the way around the lake because yesterday I fed you and you've come back for more food. Yeah? That's exactly what he says. He says, you did not come looking for me because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. But then he says something a little bit cryptic. He says, it'd be better not to work for food that goes off, but to work for food that endures into eternity and that the Son of Man would give them this food. Now imagine that offer, food that would sustain them forever. Now, for us, that seems odd. That seems something like if somebody came to us and said food that will sustain you forever, you'd go, clearly that's not going to exist. But within the Jewish mentality, it clearly did. Their creation story, the one that we find recorded in Genesis, has got the tree of life at the center of the garden that they were told to eat off and it would sustain them. So maybe in their thinking, they're thinking, is, is this man able to offer us what they had in Eden? The tree of life that would sustain them forever. Spoiler, he is. Because the tree of life is Jesus, if you hadn't clocked that from that story. But we'll, we'll, that's, not, that's not what I'm really talking about today. But yes, so naturally they will want this food. They desire this food. They don't want to be hungry forever. So they ask, okay, if that food's available, what do we have to do to get it? What works for us for me to? And he simply says, you just have to believe. Now, look what Jesus is doing here. It's like he's setting a trap for them. And he does, he does this, Jesus, if you read. He, he's, he's setting a trap and he's about to spring the trap on them. He's enticed them in by feeding them. And he's baited the trap by saying, you know, there's better food for you. That's going to last eternally. All you have to do is believe in the one who he sent. And now, Jesus, he is one question away from having them right where he wants them. And sure enough, they ask it. Because they ask, what sign will you give us so that we can believe? Boom. Jesus got the people exactly where Because you see, until they asked that question, they had a legitimate option to remain agnostic about Jesus. Until they ask that question, looking for the answer to that question, they've got the option to sit back and watch and not make their mind up about Jesus. But now they have asked for the sign so that they can believe. Whatever Jesus says now brings these people off the fence. Whatever happens, they now have to make the decision. There's no space left 
for not sure. It will only be to believe or not. And Jesus replies, you know, Moses won't give you the bread that you're looking for. My father will, and he gives you the life. So give us the bread, they cry. Or I, I, when I was reading this, it was almost like Jesus was like, I'm going to say this, and then I know you're going to say this, and then I'm going to be able to say this. And it's, it's, I, I love the way Jesus just like worked the crowd here because he says, Moses won't give you the bread. My father will give you the bread. And he sends it from heaven. So give us the bread, they cry. I am the bread of life. Trap sprung. You've said you want the bread. I'm telling you, I am the bread. You now need to make the call over whether you still want it. Yeah? So you see this whole pat, this whole thing from the feeding of 5,000 the Passover has led up to John's big statement. I've written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you will have life in his name. Do we want that bread? And do we want that bread if that bread is Jesus is the question presented by this passage. Now, we've said before here that the Bible, we've said in, during this teaching series, the Bible uses two words for life. There are two Greek words translated into life in our New Testament. The first one is bios, where we get the word biology, and it means to be alive as opposed to be dead. Okay? You then have the word zoe, which is where we get our word zoology, and it means the abundance and diversity and joy and wonder of life. To put the, help you out with that, if I would say, oh, that guy's the life of the party, you would not for a second think that everybody else has deceased. Do you see what I mean? We use life this way as well, to not just mean the opposite of dead. This is what's going on here. So there's two words. So food, bread, literal bread, that sustains our bodies. That will do deal with bios. It will keep us alive. Now, we are not less than bodies. But we are more than bodies. We are not less than our physical, but we are more than that. Food such as bread, like I said, it is necessary for being alive and not becoming dead. Food maintains bios. Jesus and his ways are what we need for our full selves to be alive. And the Greek here that Jesus says this is, I am the bread of Zoe. That's the Greek translated here. I am the bread of Zoe. I am the food that if you eat of it will give you the life promised in the kingdom of God. But food is really interesting. I don't know about you. I love food. I'm going to tell you a story. When, when Steph and I were dating before we got married, there were a couple of Christmases in that process that we, we spent with each other's families. And I'm going to level with you. Those first times that we spent time with each other's families, they were not easy. Now, I love Steph's family, but the first Christmas, oh man, it was like walking into a foreign country. I was like, what weird way of doing Christmas is this? And the first time Steph came to mine, it was also very much like, what is wrong with your family? Like you do Christmas this way. And anyone who ever gets married will know that that often happens the first Christmases because there's so much tradition around it and you, you know what's precious to you about Christmas and then you go somewhere and the things that are precious to you aren't happening. And oh, it's all a little bit... Anyway, um, but one time when Steph came to my family, as is our way, we had a cheese board. Now, the cheese board that my parents produce is something to behold. It has a massive range of different types and varieties of cheeses. And on this particular cheese board, there was a particularly nice Stilton. So I offered some to Steph, who politely refused. And I said, have you, ever, have you ever had Stilton? And she was like, no, it, look, it's all moldy. And I said, 
Oh, I know, but it's really nice. It's a really nice cheese. You should try it. And you're like, yeah, well, it's really smelly. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's really nice. Then along comes my dad. My dad's like, yeah, well, that's Stilton. Oh, it's lovely. You should, you should have Stilton. It's a really lovely cheese. So having had me and my dad, two upstanding men of God, telling her that this Stilton cheese is absolutely lovely, Steph eventually conceded and popped a piece in her mouth. And as it touched her tongue, me and my dad in unison looked at each other and went, although come to think of it, not that many people agree with us that it's nice. <laughs> Now, I want to say, and I'm going to defend this, I didn't lie. Stilton is lovely. However, Stilton is what we call an acquired taste. What that means is, very few people like it the first time they try it. Now, the interesting thing about acquired tastes is, if you speak to people who like food, like chefs, every single flavour that is at the top of their list will be acquired tastes. People who like coffee, great, you have a cup of coffee. People who really like coffee drink espresso. Most people don't like an espresso the first time they drink it. People who really like food, think about it, it's caviar. It's oysters. It's olives. It's chilies, right? Pink meat. Now, some of you are looking at me, you haven't acquired the taste, that's on you, not on me, right? The pink meat took me ages to convince certain people who I love that beef tastes better when you don't bake it for two hours. It tastes a lot better flash fried in a pan so it's still got these pink juices in it. It's a lovely flavor. Single malt whiskey. I don't know any 18-year-old any who walks into a pub on their first, first legal drinks and goes, you know what I really fancy? I'll have a 12-year-old, please. A 12-year-old from the top shelf. No, they always like the sweet-flavored fruit drinks that are really easy to drink at first. You know, it's, if we persevere with flavors, we develop a range and understanding of how wonderful these flavors are. It's hard to explain an acquired taste to somebody who doesn't have that taste. It's really difficult to explain it. You know, we use the term acquired taste to mean unpleasant. You know that. I've had some of my less wonderful meals described as the acquired taste in the past. Somebody's gone, mm, maybe it's an acquired taste. What they mean is it's horrible, right? But that's not fair. Stilton's amazing. It's not unpleasant. Espresso is amazing. It's not unpleasant. You know, I don't choke down olives as some sort of penance that I just like these disgusting. I'm just going to choke them down. I eat them because they're beautiful and because they are like, oh, ugh, beautiful food. But to find that beauty means sticking with it. Could I be so bold as to maybe suggest that if we're not careful, we might make the mistake when applying this thinking about Jesus being the bread of life. We might assume that because he is the bread of life, and because it is good for us and leads us into a heavenly style existence, it means we are going to immediately like the flavor. I'm not convinced. To be honest, I think quite the opposite. You might argue Jesus or parts of what Jesus says are an acquired taste. When I was a child, I'll give you a quick example. When I was a child, my parents taught me to tithe. They would give me my pocket money every week. And they, I just, when I was about when I was mid teenagers, they had about 10 a week as pocket money. 10 a week? That seems like a lot. Anyway, 10 a week as pocket money. And they'd always give it to me as a fiver and five pound coins. And they gave me that so I'd have the chain. They'd give it to me on a Sunday morning. They knew what they were doing. And it meant I'd have the pound to put in the bucket. Do you think I liked that at first? Do you think I liked that bit of Jesus? Learning to be generous with my money? No, I didn't. But 25 years later, you can pry tithing out of my cold dead hands before I give it up. Because I love it. 
I love it. I love what it does for me. I love the feeling of generosity. I have acquired the taste for God's way. For those of us who have followed him a long time, sometimes it's hard to understand why anybody wouldn't want Jesus. Do you ever get that? Why would anybody not want this? It's like walking past a buffet. And as you're walking down the buffet, you see a great big bowl of deliciously marinated olives. And all the rest of the plates are empty and the olives are there and you're scratching your head going, why on earth does nobody want those? I feel that about Jesus. I'm like, why on earth do people not want this? And maybe it's because the taste is not good at first. Because it pushes against our habitual diet. It pushes against the flavours we're used to. It's a different taste. When we come to Jesus to be nourished and strengthened in our innermost, at first we might find it something of an unpalatable experience. It can be hard. It pushes against our natural instincts. The people in this story who first heard Jesus say, I am the bread of life, understood this, because in verse 66 of that chapter, it's recorded many of his disciples, upon hearing this, turned back and stopped following. This was too much for them. But not the 12. In fact, Peter says, Lord, when Jesus says to Peter, are you going to go as well? Peter's answer is, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. See, Peter made up his mind about Jesus being the bread of life. And by following, he acquired the taste so much that years later, he was martyred before giving up Jesus. Because he loved Jesus so much much. Peter made up his mind, followed anyway, and by following he acquired the taste. He loved it. Now as I was preparing this morning, I also felt to suggest another consideration we might have to have to seeing Jesus as the bread of life. We cannot only have some of Jesus and Jesus be the bread of life. See, Jesus is not an all-you-can-eat multicultural buffet. You know the ones I'm talking about? You know, the ones where it's like, you go in and you get given a plate and over here there's a sushi, sushi station and over there there's the Chinese food and over there there's the Italian food and over here there's the steaks and you can go and you can go, oh yeah, I'll have a bit of that, thank you, I'll have a bit of that, don't like that, I won't have that, I'll, I'll have a bit of that and you take your plate and you eat, right? Um, we don't get to do that with Jesus. It's not how it works. He's not a pick and choose the bits you like and the bits that you think are going to be sustaining you. You can't say, you know what, I'll tell you what, Jesus, I'll have a bit of joy. I'll have a little bit of no guilt. I like that. I'll have a bit of forgiveness. That's wonderful. Um, but you know what? I uh, I think I, I'm just going to leave some of the rest of this. I don't want that on my plate. What you've picked is not going to bring you into Zoe life. Taking some of Jesus does not bring you into the life that God would offer you. I want us, I do want to bring an encouragement to us today. If we want to have a life that is moving toward the Zoe life of the kingdom of God, that God offers his people, we must make sure our diet is the bread of life. Remember the definition of diet? The kind of food a person habitually eats. We must acquire the taste for Jesus and then see to nourish ourselves on all that God has for us as his people. If in the process of following Jesus, we find things that he says or asks us to do that we would rather leave on the table... We've got to change our tastes. We've got to change our diet. We've got to pick those things up and be prepared to eat of them. As a slight aside, I'd also say, if you don't like olives, stilton, caviar, oysters, 
it's worth the effort. Just as a human thing, I, I felt like challenging people this morning to go home today as a statement of faith, go down to your local Tesco, buy a block of Stilton, right? Stick it in your fridge, cut a slice off it, and every day have half a slice in the morning and half a slice in the evening until you like the flavor. I reckon it'll take you about three or four days until every time a cheese board is offered for the rest of your life, you go for that first. It's amazing. And you know what? That is an interesting image of what we need to do with our spiritual walk with Jesus. We need to say that bit, I find that so hard, but I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to eat of it until it is something I no longer want to ever be without. You know, I mentioned already, but last week Colin spoke on tithing. It's a really good example. We might not have the taste for it. We might want to leave that on the buffet. But you know what? It's time we picked it up. And we did it until it's a taste we don't want to live without. Another is this. If you look at the life of Jesus, he is always moving. Have you seen that in the Gospels? He's always going somewhere. He's always moving. He's always going from place to place to place. He didn't stay still long. The Jesus life is one of constant change and challenge. Maybe you'd like to leave change and challenge on the table. Jesus, I'll take it all, but I'm not going to take that. You know what? I guess you can, but you're not going to get the life that Jesus offers. Because you've got to eat of his ways. He is the bread of life. He invites us to eat this bread. To let him be the source of our sustenance. And in doing so, coming into the life that God would have for you. Remember what John said. I have written these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father, we do recognize that you gave us food because it sustains our body. Lord, we want to recognize you gave us Christ to sustain our whole self. Lord, I want to repent of leaving part of Jesus on the table and saying, I'm only going to eat the bits I like. Lord, open my eyes, open our eyes to the things that we find impalatable and the things that we find hard and train us to put our trust into you and put our thoughts and our actions into your ways of being and let us know that in doing so we will inherit a life that we can live and encourage and, in, and enjoy that is greater than any other life we could offer, that, that could be offered to us. Lord, we look to you and we ask you, guide us into this, help us through it. Teach us your ways. And Lord, bring us to a point where our heart is that of Peter's. Where else would we go rather than that of the crowds who found this too hard to hear? Lord, we do this for your glory. Amen. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk